Why should you believe in your favorite team this NFL season? What's going on, football fans? It's Mitch back here with another NFL video. And in this video, the one reason to be optimistic about all 32 NFL teams, this is the reason you should believe in your team this season season. This is the reason you should be pumped, excited, even elated to watch your team this season. Gronk spike the like button. Don't forget to subscribe for more NFL videos just like this where I go in depth on all 32 NFL teams. And let me know in the comment section below if you agree with my optimistic reason, the reason to watch your team this year. And the reason you should really believe in your team. Now, these reasons aren't just the strengths of every team, but also looking at the team last year and then how they've potentially progressed into 2024 for a reason to maybe believe that they'll be better this year. Maybe they'll be just as good as last year. Let's go, man. Let's go in alphabetical order. Beginning with the Arizona Cardinals. The Arizona Cardinals' reason to be optimistic in 2024 is their explosive offense. Their explosive offense that they didn't quite have last year. Since DeAndre Hopkins left Kyler Murray, this offense has not been the same. Now Kyler Murray gets a wide receiver that I kind of compared to DeAndre Hopkins coming out of college. That's Marvin Harrison Jr. Marvin Harrison Jr. is one of the best wide receiver prospects we've seen in quite some time. He's ready to take the NFL field by storm. And I believe he'll bring an element to the Cardinals and to the NFL that will be really impactful to this team and this offense. I think he's going to be able to make 50-50 catches on the regular, convert short catches in the first downs, and I think he's going to need a double team against most NFL teams almost immediately in his NFL career. I think he could be that good right away. He's got incredible hands. He's a very smooth, savvy, timing route runner. He just understands nuances of wide receiver play far beyond his years. He is a mix of a Devontae Adams slash his own father, slash DeAndre Hopkins. He has that type of vibe to me, and I think he will bring a command to the receiving depth chart that Kyler desperately needed. But it's not only Marvin Harrison Jr., it's the others surrounding Kyler Murray. Not only Kyler Murray himself, with his ability to scramble, run, you know, pick up first downs, like the roadrunner, extending plays, doing his thing, beep, beep. But also, he can throw to one of the best up-and-coming tight ends in football, Trey McBride, who's an absolute beast, who plays with an edge and a chip on his shoulder, can create yards after the catch, and is a dimension over the middle of the field. You've got Marvin Harrison Jr. on the outside. You've got Trey McBride right in line of the formation or potentially in the slot. Greg Dorch could also be in the slot, a guy that I think is highly underrated and can work the underneath portion of the field. I think Wilson could also be that nice number two option in his second year, showing some flashes as a rookie. And then you've also got an offensive line that has two pretty good tackles now. I like the Jonah Williams pickup. Paris Johnson in his year two at left tackle should be pretty promising. And the interior was already pretty solid, especially Will Hernandez opening up run holes for James Conner, who was an absolute monster last year and should continue to be an absolute monster to take down out of that backfield. I could see the Cardinals bringing a lot of different dimensions to the table. Downfield passing attack through the air running the football from the gun, and then also adding that element of Kyler Murray's magic, this offense could be really fun. Even if this team isn't very good, they could score a lot of points. So that's why you should watch the Cardinals in 2024. For the Atlanta Falcons, I think the reason to be optimistic is you finally have a professional quarterback. You finally have a quarterback since Matt Ryan retired that can actually operate an NFL offense, actually make correct decisions, actually throw an accurate ball, actually have the offense on schedule and bring a product to the offensive football and that side of the football that should take place. 
This is no longer a Marcus Mariota erratic passing game that's truly a run-first offense. It's no longer Desmond Ritter's S-H-I-D-D-E-R. You know what I mean? This is a fire falcon offense in 2024. One that can run the football. One that can throw the football. One that on early downs is going to be one of the best offenses in football because they've got a great offensive line that can smash the ball down your throats and that can play action you to death. They've got a talented tight end. They've got a big target outside at wide receiver. They've got a speed target in Darnell Mooney. And if Cousins is even half of what he was, this will be an improved offense. And this will be a good offense. So I think the, the Falcons, it's pretty self-explanatory. They actually have a quarterback. The Baltimore Ravens, biggest reason to be optimistic is as much as I've ripped them this offseason and potentially been saying that they could take a step back, I think there's also a reason they could actually get it done this year. Mark Andrews is back. He is back. He did not really play last year for a majority of the NFL season. And by the time he came back against the Chiefs, he was kind of half of himself. He was a shell of himself. He wasn't the same player. He was playing injured. It wasn't really fair. But Mark Andrews is a beast. He's one of the best tight ends in football. He's a great red zone threat. He is a third down chain mover. He has been the guy that teams have most often double covered in Lamar Jackson's career, which should open up everybody else, including Zay Flowers and Rashad Bateman. Not only do you have Mark Andrews back, but you've also brought the king to Baltimore, Derrick Henry, who's a threat in his own right, a guy that demands you to stack the box, a guy that can run you over, a guy that can take over a playoff game, a guy that maybe will be able to bail out Lamar Jackson in the big moments when maybe he's not playing his best football in January and you can actually just hand it off to the big number Derrick Henry and just churn out first downs and run the rock and really demand a team to stop the run and then that will loosen things up for Lamar in the back end. And another reason, combining it all, and really the overall overarching point here is the weaponry that Lamar now has. He's got the running back in Derrick Henry. He's got a healthy Mark Andrews, never mind still Isaiah Likely there. And then Zay Flowers entering year two. If you thought Zay Flowers was good as a rookie, I would watch out because he could be even better in year number two, understanding what he can do at the NFL level, working on his craft and getting that much better. I would be scared to try to defend this Ravens team this year. If you can't get pressure and you can't stop the run, you're going to be in a long day because they can attack you in a multitude of ways with the MVP at quarterback. So the Ravens, the weaponry that supports Lamar at all levels is pretty impressive. For the Buffalo Bills, I think the reason to be optimistic, I could just say Josh Allen, but I'm not going to be boring. So going beyond that, I think that you have a healthy Sean McDermott offense, or defense, I should say. You have a healthy Sean McDermott defense, and I'm getting ahead of myself because my next line is that you actually have a full offseason with your offensive coordinator, Joe Brady. So you have not only a healthy defense under a good defensive coach in Sean McDermott, but you have now a full offseason with now a group of weapons that feel like it's been calculated and cur curated by Joe Brady himself to bring together to support Josh Allen. Right? Last year, Brady was taking on an offense that was not exactly his own. It was made for somebody else. It was somebody else's offense that he had to kind of maneuver, manipulate, and change. Now they've gone out with a purpose in this offseason to get the right weapons for him, right? Curtis Samuel is an example of a player that he had in Carolina that he liked a lot that he brought to Buffalo. Another example of that would be picking up some bigger receivers like Chase Claypool or Mac Hollins, guys that might be vicious in run blocking or also add some speed and some outside big frame ability to the offense. So there's different flavors now on top of having a big wide receiver that they drafted in the first round. So there was an obvious need for not only speed from Curtis Samuel, multi-dimensionality of Curtis Samuel, but also size and speed that the Bills now signed up to their roster to help Joe Brady. But then you've got the other side of things with the overall coaching of Sean McDermott now with his defense hopefully staying healthy. Matt Milano, the key cog, the key guy, the guy that 
you know, is the signal caller of the defense, the leader, the middle of the defense, the heart and soul of the defense is back. That is huge, right? Then you also have the fact that, okay, the secondary is healthy. Guys like Benford, Johnson, actually Sewell Douglas will have a full offseason to work within this defense. You've got a little bit more youth on the back end of the defense with guys like Bishop, right? So the defense is healthy. The defense has gone through a little bit of a change in terms of some of the personnel. But now McDermott will have all of his tools to play with, all of his characters in play here, a part of his screenplay. So it's going to be fascinating to see how the Bills are able to now coach this team because I think now, unlike late last year, they were just trying everything they could to piece these things together on both sides of the ball, and then Josh Allen was just carrying the team. Now they're actually maybe going to have a calculated team with actual proper tactics that that fit the actual roster. So that's why I would be optimistic about the Buffalo Bills in 2024. The Carolina Panthers' reason to be optimistic is that Bryce Young has some help. So in my previous video, I said that Bryce Young might just be bad, right? So that might be a reason to be negative. But if Bryce is going to be good, it's going to be thanks to having a little bit more help, just as it happened for a guy like Tua Tagovailoa, where he was absolutely terrible in his first two seasons. He then got Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddell was around, and they, they beefed up the team with Mike McDaniel's play calling, and all of a sudden, the team got a heck of a lot better. Well, you look at Carolina now, you got a big stud right guard in Hunt, you've got a new left guard in Damian Lewis, you've already got good tackles, you've got a new play caller in Dave Canales, a young, vibrant guy that can keep him positive and lead the way. And then you also have another running back, arguably the most talented one out of the draft coming out of Texas in Brooks. You've got Deontay Johnson, a really good route runner. I think one of the best in the NFL. And you, then you add a first round receiver in Xavier Leggett. So there's a lot to like about what they did around Bryce Young. He's got no excuses any longer. He still has his number one target in Adam Thielen. He's got a sol solid ground game already foundation there. He's got an improved interior offensive line to help his small little man syndrome to grow and get better. And, you know, like he shouldn't be under pressure as much. He should be getting rid of the ball on time because guys should be open. And at least there won't be reasons to not evaluate Bryce Young because last year it felt like that was the case where sure like he wasn't great but it was also hard to evaluate him because he just didn't have any help but now he actually has help so he's rather going to succeed or this thing thing is going to be solved either way so you know what I mean so the Carolina Panthers they got some help for Bryce that will help solve your riddle the Chicago Bears reason to be optimistic is that it's year number one of the Caleb Williams experience, and they already have a ton of talent around the young quarterback, which is something as a Mac Jones fan that, trust me, and, and you would know as a Justin Fields fan, like, it's hard to get that talent around your young quarterback. A lot of teams choose not to do it mistakenly, and I think incorrectly, and it costs them the development and the chance of having a franchise quarterback. Now the Bears have learned from their past mistake of Justin Fields. As a Patriots fan, I saw things go the wrong way with Mac Jones. You know, year one was fantastic. Then after that was a disaster. He never had the help around him. The offensive coordinator changes, all that sort of stuff. Caleb Williams is going to have a chance to succeed right away. Because not only did they have DJ Moore and Cole Komet and a decent enough young offensive line that had a first round pick from the year previous, but and a good defense too, they've got a new, de a new offensive coordinator, right? Waldron and, and the new offensive staff should be pretty interesting there. And they run one of the most commonly ran offenses in football in terms of that kind of Rams, Sean McVay type of system, which is very, you know, well-regarded across the NFL. Then you've got, okay, we've got DJ Moore, but now we go out and we trade for Keenan Allen. So we have one of the best chain movers, one of the most consistent receivers in the NFL, a guy that's capable of catching 100 passes in a given season. And then we also sign, or draft, I should say, a first round wide receiver, not even first round, but top 10 wide receiver, who is widely considered one of the best wide receiver prospects of the last couple of years in Roma Dunze. This was just kind of happened to be an extremely, extremely loaded wide receiver class. So... Yeah, Roma Dunze is an 
a stud. So you've got all the different elements, right? Keenan Allen, chain mover, Roma Dunze, 50-50 catcher, DJ Moore, do it all, number one wide receiver. And you've got solutions for the short term in Keenan Allen, long term for a Dunze. You've got a tight end to throw to. You've got a receiving running back in DeAndre Swift to throw to. There is no excuses why Caleb shouldn't at least feel comfortable in year one. He might struggle because he's a rookie. That just happens. But he shouldn't have any reasons to not believe that this should work. And he shouldn't have any reasons like Mac Jones kind of did where he was blaming other people and things like that. So things should at least be fun to watch early with Caleb Williams and the Bears, which is all you can really ask for. Next. We've got the Cincinnati Bengals. The reason to be optimistic about the Bengals is that Joe Burrow is back and the Bengals are hungry. T. Higgins is back. Didn't really, you know, worry about that contract after a certain point. They're all in. Jamar Chase, Trey Hendrickson. All the boys are pretty much intact, right? Like Von Bell even came back to the football team. <laughs> like they've got Mike Hilton still, Trey Hendrickson, Sam Hubbard, B.J. Hill, they added a couple pieces to the team on the offensive line, on the defense. So Joe Burrow is back, one of the legit best quarterbacks in the game, arguably the most accurate quarterback in the game, arguably one of the best leaders in the sport right now. And you've also got just that hunger of last year they didn't make the playoffs, last year Burrow got hurt, last year they got a sense of, just that hunger back after two kind of really competitive years. 2022, they barely lost to the Chiefs in the AFC Championship. They felt that pain. They had to deal with that all last year and never have a chance to get back there because they lost their quarterback. And then the year before that, they lost the Super Bowl, which that pain is still in your mind, right? It's in the back of your head. So the Bengals are that team where it's like, they may appear to be, let's say, less talented than some of the other AFC teams or not have the pedigree of the Chiefs or whatever. But one thing that they do have that can't be really calculated is they've been close. They haven't accomplished it yet, and they're going to be very, very hungry. So that's why I have a reason to be optimistic. This will be a hungry Bengals team on a hunt. The Cleveland Brownies. Reason to be optimistic is that the offensive line and Nicholas Chubb are healthy. And the team is stacked, right? That was what was missing last year from the Browns. Uh, of course, Sean Watson also was out. But Joe Flacco filled in admirably. But this team was not 100% even with Flacco there. Nick Chubb, arguably the heart and soul of the team, the explosive running back, one of the best pure runners in football. The identity of this team for the last few years has been running the football down people's throats. It wasn't the same without him. It wasn't the same without the tackles. It wasn't the same with the injured and banged up offensive line. Now they've got that identity back. So even if Deshaun is not what we hope him to be in Cleveland, they can still rely on their identity from the past, which is running the football, which is Nick Chubb, which is now the defense, a defensive run-heavy team with a quarterback that can just be a little bit of a manager and make a few plays every game. That can still win you a lot of games in this NFL. So reason to be optimistic is that the offensive line and Nick Chubb are back. For the Dallas Cowboys, the reason to be optimistic is that they still have studs everywhere on their team. And last year was arguably Dak Prescott's best season in the regular season of his career. So you might be seeing peak Dak Prescott, which last year was capable of carrying the offense, the team, and getting them a pretty far ways and being one of the better teams in the NFC last year. On top of that, you've still got one of the legit top three or four receivers in the NFL in C.D. Lamb. You've got a top three or four pass rusher in the NFL in Micah Parsons. You've got awesome players all around from Trayvon Diggs to Zach Martin to Tyler Smith to Demarcus Lawrence. And again, I said Trayvon Diggs, who is back and didn't play last year. So a lot of the key areas that you want your football team to be good. Pass rush. Okay, we got studs. Corners and secondary. Yeah, we've got really good players there. Wide receiver. We've got a stud there. 
quarterback. We've got a player that was almost the MVP last year. So when you look at the Cowboys, they might be more flawed than last year or the year before from a pure roster standpoint. But in terms of the studs, they still exist, which means you should still be in the running for winning a lot of football games. The Denver Broncos are up next. The Broncos' reason to be optimistic is the coaching staff. I think I've seen a lot of people say that the Broncos are pretty underrated entering this year. And I think the only real reason you would say that is if you just undoubtedly believe that Sean Payton is still an excellent coach and Vance Joseph in his own right is a great adjuster and a great defensive coordinator as well. And I wouldn't necessarily disagree with either one of those notions. I think both of them are great at their jobs. I think Sean Payton is still a very good coach. I would not put him in my top five head coaches in the NFL as of late. He has not proven that fact since Drew Brees retired. He has not obviously had that success, but obviously he has not had the same level of quarterback play. That being said, I still think Sean Payton is a very good coach. And then Vance Joseph, you know, you have to remember, this guy gave up like a record amount of points and yards in that Miami Dolphins game early last year when he was trying to figure out and hone in on what this defense was. He changed and altered his identity and what they were going to be. And they became one of the low key, like more competitive defenses by the end of the year. And they were going on a really solid run by the end of the year on defense. So Vance Joseph is a really good coordinator. I've always been a pretty big fan of him on a defensive side. I don't think he's like elite or anything, but I do think he's very solid and he does adjust really well. And he does like attack you on defense, which I, I've always liked about his scheme. So I think if you're optimistic about the Broncos, it's not because of the roster or the talent or the quarterback or whatever. It's because our coaching can maximize the talent that we have. So we understand what we might have for the future and we understand what, that we have a good foundation in place. So the coaching is definitely really promising there in Denver. The Detroit Lions reason to be optimistic is obviously they were an NFC contender last year. They went to the NFC championship. They took the Niners to the absolute brink. And to me, the Detroit Lions reason to be optimistic is that they still have the same core offense. Ben Johnson is back. Jared Goff, the two running backs, Amon Ra, Laporta. Offensive line is still excellent. You right. You swap out Jackson for Zeitler. But the reason to really be optimistic is that the defense on paper is much better. The secondary is much better. Carlton Davis, they added a first-round pick in Terry and Arnold. They added another uh, corner safety hybrid in the draft pretty early. They've got younger guys like Melon Fonwu developing pretty well. Brian Branch developing pretty well. So, yeah, overall, the defense... You add Marcus Davenport for depth on the D-line. You add a big man in the middle like DJ Reader to form one of the best D-tackle duos in football. Jack Campbell enters year two. The defense could be drastically better this year. It could elevate from a competitive unit, an optimistic unit that kind of got by because of the offense was really good and they kind of thrived off the offense to being a unit that's well-rounded, that can cover now, that doesn't get ripped up by number one wide receivers things like that, and they're really good against the run, and they can get after the quarterback, especially at home. I could see the Lions being a pretty dominant defense with that crowd noise and things like that. So I think the Lions' reason to believe that they could take that next step is the defense. The Green Bay Packers' reason to be optimistic is that they have a new defensive coordinator. And I know that's really simple, but they've had arguably the worst defensive coordinator in Barry the last couple of years in the NFL. Like, he has been horrendous. He has not elevated any of the talent on this team that has been first-round pick after first-round pick after first... You just look at the front seven, the secondary, like, all these first-round picks that exist on the Green Bay Packers' defense. Like, just the defense. And you're like, how is this defense not good? How is this defense not better? How is this defense not flirting with the top 10? And now I think the reason to be optimistic is like, we've got a different scheme coming in. We've got a different defense coming in. We're totally changing what we've been doing on defense. And that gives me a reason to believe we'll be a little bit more sound, a little bit better, and not have those games where like we just get shredded by Baker Mayfield at home. That should not happen, right? So the Packers' biggest reason to be optimistic it has nothing to do, you know, the offense is explosive. The offense is going to be good. We know we can run the ball. We know we've got big play capability on offense, but... If the defense could actually be better, that could be where the, the Packers take a next step. The Houston Texans' reason to be optimistic is I believe there's an organizational belief that the Texans, the Houston organization is hungry. 
And you can sense that by what they did this offseason. They sign a veteran like Daniil Hunter. They sign another veteran like Danico Autry. They go out there and get a veteran running back like Joe Mixon, a veteran receiver like Stephon Diggs. What do all these guys have in common? They all have great careers and none of them have won a Super Bowl. They all have been deep in the playoffs, but none of them have won a Super Bowl. They all have playoff experience, but none of them have won a Super Bowl. And we've already got young guys that are at the brink of breaking out, right? Like we've got Nico Collins, who's already a stud, but then Tank Dell is like right there on his heels and he's getting to get to that level. We got CJ Stroud, who's almost like top five status at quarterback. Our offensive line is young, a lot of them. Shaq Mason brings championship experience, but the rest of them have been like hungry to be at this level. You've got a guy like Dalton Schultz who's kind of the same thing. And another veteran that's like still in his prime, but still he's been in the playoffs. He just hasn't been able to get there. The defense, uh, like there's a lot of young guys like Will Anderson, like Derek Stingley, like uh, Jalen Petrie, guys that are going to be like entering their prime here. So Houston is hungry. Houston added in year two of C.J. Stroud. They said, no, we're not waiting another year. We're going for it right now. We believe we can do this right now. We don't know how much longer we're going to have this coaching staff together, how much longer we're going to have all these pieces together. We've got to do it right now. And credit Nick Casario for finding the right pieces to fill out this roster. So the reason to be optimistic is that they found veterans that I believe are hungry for a championship. This team, this, this city, the whole vibe makes me believe that they're right there. They're going to be fighting. They believe that they're there. So that's really exciting. The Indianapolis Colts reason to be optimistic is the line of scrimmage play from this team. The offensive line, I think is excellent from left to right. They don't exactly have a hole, but of course you've got Kelly in the middle. You've got Nelson and like they're going to be able to run the ball. They're going to be able to run the ball on people. Anthony Richardson can run the ball. Jonathan Taylor can run the ball. That's going to open up the passing game. And then defensively, they've got layers of pass rush now. You add, in my opinion, the best pure pass rusher in the draft in Latu. You've already got guys that are kind of hitting their peak of play. Epicam had a be best season of his career last year. Quiddy Pay is right there on the breakout threshold. DeForest Buckner is an absolute stud. So you've got a really good pass rush. You've got a really good offensive line that can really overpower people. And now you've got the makings of one of the better offensive defensive line combinations in the league, which is always sneaky dangerous for any team. The Jacksonville Jags reason to be optimistic is that this is maybe the most explosive Trevor Lawrence Jags team of his career. You add a guy like Brian Thomas Jr. who has legit like low end 4-3, high end 4-2 speed, and he's big, he's fast, he's like DK Metcalf cloned, and you add that to a guy that has a huge arm in Trevor Lawrence who had a number of passes down the field that were dropped that could have been big plays, and you say, okay, we've got a guy that can sling it. We've got a receiver that can really burn people. That's going to change how defenses play us. We've got a running back that has legit home run ability and Travis Etienne. We've got a tight end who's one of the fastest in football in Evan Ingram. We've got a slot receiver that can run vertical in Christian Kirk. We've got a, a, a number two receiver who is a home run waiting to happen in Gabe Davis. So we've got overall a very big play oriented offense on paper, which is very, very exciting. So... The Jags had the most explosive team in the Trevor Lawrence era. The Kansas City Chiefs' reason to be optimistic is that Patrick has new Mahomies. Yep, that's right. He's earned some new targets after last year's debacle. He has Marquise Brown, who's a veteran, who's been well-established in the NFL from the Baltimore Ravens to the Arizona Cardinals and has been highly productive, especially in the slot and his ability to run that second-level, third-level threat in the defense with speed. And he's going to be, I think, like a very reliable option. I think he's sneaky good in that like 15-yard range. On top of that, you've got added to the, the fold here, Xavier Leggett. Okay, so you've got Xavier, Le or Xavier Leggett, Xavier Worthy, my bad, out of Texas. How do we have two of the same name, the weirdest name in the draft in the same draft? But anyways, Worthy might be Worthy of the Kansas City Chiefs. He's just extremely explosive. One of the most explosive receivers coming out of college in quite some time. Fastest 
40 in combine history, but he's also got the quickness to go along with the vertical speed. He's a great yak threat in terms of the screen ability. He can take handoffs. You can use him in a lot of different ways as a rookie. He can actually return punts and things like that as he did at Texas. And he can also play on the outside, play on the inside, and try to try to just create space for this offense, create space for the running game, create space for Travis Kelsey to work underneath and create space for guys like Marquise Brown, Rasheed Rice to run their underneath patterns, Rasheed Rice especially running those drag routes underneath. But you've got Rasheed Rice in year two. You've got his old buddy in Travis Kelsey. You've still got Miko Hardman there. You've got Worthy and Brown that have added this speed and this vertical dimension and this yards after catch dimension that have been lost really for the last couple of years. So... I, I think that is the reason to be optimistic about the Chiefs because I don't think you can really count on the defense to be as good as last year. They should still be very good, but it's just hard to replicate what they did in the playoffs. So in order to win the three-peat, in order to get that three-peat, you're going to have to be more explosive on offense, which I think they definitely could be. Then you've got the Las Vegas Raiders. Max has a friend. That's why you should be optimistic. Max Crosby finally has somebody to help him on the defensive line. And you thought it might be Tyree Wilson last year, and it might still be Tyree Wilson after the kind of injury-riddled rookie season. He could still develop into a stud, but we're not counting on that now. We've got Christian Wilkins out of the Miami Dolphins, who is one of the most disruptive pass rushers from the interior in football, one of the best run defenders in the NFL, period. And he's going to take a load off of Max Crosby. He's going to really, really help him. So... You've got an interior penetrator. Now you've got a ferocious edge rusher. And that can just make this defensive line low-key one of the more explosive units in the NFL. So now Crosby isn't the only one that's going to be counted on in a big moment. Other guys like Wilkins can help him out. So that's a big reason to be optimistic about the defense and the team. The Los Angeles Chargers' reason to be optimistic is that Herbert has a coach, and his name is Harbaugh. Herbert finally has a respectable head coach that can install a culture and winning ways and knows how to actually win, right? Brandon Staley was not a head coach, did ha not have winning experience. They did not have winning coach mentality before that. Like, they, they didn't know what it was like. They didn't know, like, long-term sustained success and Harbaugh has done that at the college level, everywhere he's been, the NFL level, where he's been in San Francisco. I just recently watched that Super Bowl, by the way, which the 49ers kind of blew the end of the game in the four down sequence. But regardless, Harbaugh knows how to win. That's what he does. And Herbert needs that type of coach. He needs a hard ass. He needs a guy that's going to come in there and he's going to rule this team. Herbert is a great talent at quarterback. But let's be fair, the biggest weakness in his whole arsenal is perhaps his like motivating leadership skills. And so as long as he can just be the talented thrower of the football that he is and allow Herbert to do the thing on the field, Harbaugh to do the thing from a front office standpoint, from a, a team standpoint, they should be well calculated for the future. The Los Angeles Rams reason to be most optimistic is... The most obvious reason, it's Sean McVay and Matthew Stafford. This could be the last ride, the last, the last couple of years, the last year perhaps of Stafford and McVay. But what we have here is we have a championship combination. The first year they ever worked together, they won a championship. That is huge. On top of that, Stafford is a killer in the last moments of every game. He's great in the two-minute situations, and he is a quarterback that Sean McVay can actually trust in the biggest moments, in the biggest games, and they can understand each other at a different level now because they've worked with each other for multiple seasons. And they also now have something called a recall, which is what the best coordinators and coach combinations have had in NFL history. An ability to recall something that happened in a past game that they can work on in a current game to help them win this next game against a new opponent, something that Brady and McDaniels did, for example, and I'm sure Reed and Mahomes have to some level. But Stafford and McVay certainly will have that recall and that chemistry. And then that is going to just, that leadership from both these players and that clutch ability from Stafford feeds, the team feeds on it. So that's why the Rams should be optimistic in 2024. The Miami Dolphins 
reason to be optimistic is they have the most explosive offense in the NFL. And I also believe that they have a pretty darn explosive defense as well. When you think about they added Kendall Fuller, they have Phillips, Chubb, they added a, a first round pass rusher. They have Shaq Barrett now. They got Calais Campbell now. They have Javon Holland now. All these different pieces that are explosive on defense. Like a lot of fast guys, but Jalen Ramsey, like guys that can turn the football over. Shaq Barrett has a knack for that. Ramsey has a knack for that. Holland is fast. Campbell is a big game and big play player, right? Like all these guys that can pitch in on a big play. Jordan Poyer's been there, done that. Marcus May has been there, done that. Like the reason to flip the old man retirement home thing on its head is we've now got experience at a championship level. We've got experience to be able to do this thing and and make some big plays and big moments for our offense. And on the other side, our offense, we got Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle. And not only that, we have an Olympic running back room. We've got right out of the draft. We've got A. Shane in year two. We've got Raheem Mosert, who's been one of the fastest running backs in the NFL for a number of years now. We've got Jonu Smith, one of the best yak threats at tight end in the NFL. We've got Odell Beckham Jr. coming off the bench as our, our wide receiver three, who's still capable of making a big play. So we've got so much explosiveness on offense, defense. We can make big plays all over. The Minnesota Vikings reason to be optimistic is that the coaching staff is top tier and there is enough talent on the team outside of the quarterback position to be pretty optimistic about where this team could go this year and definitely for the future but right Brian Flores now has some friends Brian Flores brought in Andrew Van Ginkle Brian Flores and this defense brought in Blake Cashman Jonathan Grenard Jerry Tillery Gruje Hill, the list goes on. They brought in different players in order to fill out the, the sore spots of the defense. The offense has a ton of weapons to work with for Kevin O'Connell, who is a brilliant play caller and one of my favorite coaches right now in the league. I love his demeanor. I love the way that he operates. I love the way he speaks. I love the way that he calls plays in third down in red zone situations. You've got Jefferson back and healthy. You've got Hawkinson. You've got Addison. You've got Jones. I mean, a lot of pieces to really piece it together. So for me... The Minnesota Vikings, they've got the coaching to really be able to elevate this roster and enough of a roster to elevate the quarterback. The New England Patriots' reason to be optimistic is that the defense is dominant. And I mean it's going to be one of the top five defenses in the NFL and it's going to keep them in every single game, which is going to help the young quarterback in Drake May or whichever quarterback starts. Gerard Mayo, I still believe, will bring a championship-level defense to the table. It's going to be up to the offense to be successful for them to be a successful team. But the defense, they've got legit studs. I mean, Christian Barmore is an up-and-coming star at defensive tackle. Matthew, Matthew Judon is still one of the better pass rushers in football. Josh Uche, Anthony Jennings at the other edge spot are a really good combination. We had a career year out of Tavai last year. Juwan Bentley is low-key, one of the most underrated linebackers in the league. Peppers and Duggar is one of the best safety combos in the league. Christian Gonzalez is an up-and-coming star. Jonathan Jones is a really reliable corner. Marcus Jones is an explosive play waiting to happen. They've got a lot of different elements to the defense, to the team, uh, on that side of the ball that makes you believe that they can be in every game, that they can win every game because their defense is going to keep them in it. The New Orleans Saints' reason to be optimistic is that they have the best front seven that they've had since 2021, 2020. Like, this is the best front seven on defense that they've had in quite some time for Dennis Allen. And if this team is going to be successful, I do believe it's going to have to stem from the defense. If the defense is not making plays, they're not pressuring the quarterback, if they're not forcing turnovers, if they're not doing their thing, they're not going to win enough games to make the playoffs. They're not going to win this division. I, that's what I believe because I don't think Derek Carr can carry this team. I think it's going to come down to the defense first. I really do believe that. I think, you know, you look at the front seven now, you add a guy like Willie Gay who can really help, I think, aid Demario Davis. If Davis is getting a little bit older and he's more uh, closer to the line of scrimmage in terms of blitzing and defending the run, Gay is really, really good at, you know, 
reaching his arms out, tipping down passes, covering, doing those sort of things, having a lot of range. So those two can help each other out. He's also experienced as a blitzer as well, coming from Spagnolo's defense. But then you've got Chase Young added to the mix, a little bit of a different flavor to help out guys like Granderson and Cameron Jordan and making that rotation a bit deeper. Brzee enters year two, pretty promising prospect there. They just seem to be deeper on the defensive line, seem to be better at linebacker. So the secondary has always been able to cover and has had good talent, but the front seven the last couple of years has desperately needed an impact pass rusher. I feel like they're definitely better in that element. So the Saints, that's a reason to be optimistic. The New York Giants reason to be optimistic is that the front seven is pretty fun and should definitely control a lot of games and keep them in a number of games. Dexter Lawrence is the best nose tackle in the NFL. Brian Burns was traded to the Giants to get after the quarterback, and he has been a stud since he entered the NFL. Uh, Kayvon Thibodeau, despite Lawrence Taylor saying he sucks, had, what, 11 and a half sacks last year and can force fumbles and make big plays. He's got a knack for it, right? They've got big boys in the middle. So, and even, like, to the second level, Okereke is, is an excellent linebacker. So, yeah, the front seven of the Giants is going to be able to penetrate a, a weakening, a, a deteriorating Dallas offensive line. Washington has a really weak offensive line. Maybe they'll be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Eagles up front. So in that division, it makes them a little bit more interesting. So the Giants' front seven is definitely the biggest strength on their team and a reason to really be excited for this season. The New York Jets' reason to be optimistic is that Aaron Rodgers does not have to carry the team. Aaron Rodgers does not have to be MVP Aaron Rodgers to win the Super Bowl or to like, like get to the AFC Championship, win a playoff game, which is what the Jets are all about right now. Like, sure, they would love to win the Super Bowl. Don't get me wrong, but the Jets have had such a long time since they made the playoffs. It's, you know, been since what, 2011 since they made the playoffs. So they just want to make the playoffs. And the fact that they have one of the top defenses in football, arguably the strongest, best defense in football. A lot of the guys are in their prime at their peak. The offensive line is greatly improved from Tyron Smith to Morgan Moses, etc. They added a Mike Williams to complement Garrett Wilson. They have Brees Hall. Like, they can run the ball. They can throw the ball. They, they have multiple dimensions in the passing game. They've got an excellent defense, a great pass rush, a defense that can take over a game. Aaron Rodgers does not have to throw for 300 yards. He does not have to have three touchdown games. He can manage the game. He doesn't have to be Tom Brady in Tampa. He can be more like Peyton in Denver, which is a great thing. Next, we've got the Philadelphia Eagles. And the reason to be optimistic is they have new coordinators, which equals new life for them. Kellen Moore is going to freshen up the offense. It's been said that, you know, a lot of the offense is going to be new. It's going to be probably more under center based, probably more play action based, probably less of the spread base of what they were doing under Steichen and then from last year. It's probably going to be more complicated, probably more diverse, probably less simplified, which is definitely going to help them because I felt like the biggest weakness last year and the year previous, is they were just too simple and teams knew how to attack them. It's just in 2022, they couldn't stop them because their O-line was so damn good and their receivers were so damn good that it didn't matter what they called, it would still work. But they've got a new offensive coordinator who's a, a pretty good one. Then defensively, they've got one of the most well-renowned defensive coordinators of the past decade in Vic Fangio, who should, if anyone can, be able to fix this defense. It's got enough talent to be able to fix it. It comes down to the coaching. Last year, the coaching wasn't there. I think that the Eagles can definitely be better in those facets this year. Then we've got the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Pittsburgh Steelers' biggest reason to be optimistic is that they have the best offensive line that they've had in years. Years, okay? So the Pittsburgh Steelers have had a terrible, no good, awful offensive line really since even before Ben Roethlisberger retired, but now they've drafted back-to-back -back tackles in their offense. They've got a fresh new young center. They've got two really good guards as well that they've signed the last couple of seasons. So Daniels, uh, Samalu, or Samalu, you know, <laughs> Jones is entering year two, should take a, a step up. And then on top of that, not only do you have more talent on the offensive line, youth and veterans, a mix of both, but Arthur Smith is a really good O-line guy. Like, if he does anything well, it's making that offensive line better and thrive and get better in the run game. So, yeah, definitely. Then next up, we got the San Francisco 49ers. The 49ers... The reason to be optimistic is that Brock Purdy finally has a full offseason where he's healthy, that he can work on his craft, 
and work with Kyle Shanahan and actually add layers to his game. Because remember, last year, he didn't have that. He was basically recovering from the elbow. People didn't even know if he was going to be able to throw the ball well against the Steelers in week one. So they didn't really have that benefit last year. The year before, he wasn't the starter. He was the third string. No one knew he was going to play. So they actually have a full offseason. That is a huge reason to believe the Niners can take a step forward this year and a huge reason why Purdy can go from MVP candidate to actual most valuable player because he could be on fire this year, especially from a mental capacity standpoint where now he's just clicking in the offense because he's been there and done that. The Seattle Seahawks' reason to be optimistic is Mike McDonald's defense. His scheme is at the forefront of the NFL. He's the best defensive coordinator in the NFL, in my opinion. And he's got the talent in Seattle to be able to run this thing to a pretty high level. Devin Witherspoon as his hybrid nickel player. You've got a guy like Julian Love at safety who can do a lot of different things. Even Rayshon Jenkins was a sneaky little ad. I like the linebackers. Dodson out of Buffalo has got good range to his game. But the D-line especially is what I'm optimistic about. Draymond Jones, Leonard Williams, and Byron Murphy is a sick trio in the inside of the defense. And you add Jonathan Hankins to stop the run as well. The edge rushers with Mafe and Nwosu are pretty underrated. So I think the Seahawks have like low-key a top 10 defense this year. And thanks to Mike McDonald's scheme, but also because they've got the, the talent to run in the scheme. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers' reason to be optimistic is that the core of what won them the Super Bowl, other than Tom Brady, is still intact, right? They've got Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, Tristan Wirfs, Levante David, Vita Vea, Antoine Winfield, Jordan Whitehead returns, Jamel Dean is still there. They've still got a lot of the pieces, and that means they're still a well-run team. They've still got that leadership. They've still got that championship pedigree, that experience. And ever since they've had that and that Tom Brady kind of rub off effect they've been a successful franchise even since he's left baker has come in did his thing and this team has remained successful so the Tampa bay buccaneers that that core is still there for the tennessee titans a new look offense should be exciting for this team right calvin ridley deandre hopkins complimenting him with tyler boyd in the slot is really fascinating tony pollard as a new running back element Will Levis in his first full year, a new offensive line coach to elevate a new left tackle in J.C. Latham, Peter Skaronsky in his second year, right? A guy like Cushenberry at center, who was a top 10 center last year. You've had improvements at wide receiver. You've had improvements at offensive line. You've got improvements in coaching, offensive scheme, coordinator, offensive line coach. So all those things are reasons to be extremely excited to watch the Titans. No longer are they an old school defensive team. They're an offensive team. And then the Washington Commanders, last but certainly not least, it's a new era in Washington. This is perhaps the biggest reason for any team to be optimistic. They don't have an absolute D-bag of an of a owner anymore. They don't have a probably past his prime and, and worn down coach in Ron Rivera or a horrible defensive coordinator in Jack Del Rio. They have a fresh new approach, a young offensive coordinator in Cliff Kingsbury. They've got a defensive guy that's running the team, that's a great culture guy that's been to a Super Bowl before and Dan Quinn that can steer this ship in the right direction. They've got a new GM who's doing different things. They've got a new ownership, a new outlook, a new fun side to this franchise. So it's a new era in Washington and that's something to be excited about. So those are the reasons to be optimistic about all 32 NFL teams. Gronk, spike the like button if you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. It's Mitch. We'll see you in the next video. Peace.